hope you're having a great day. In this video, I will be going over some basics of RStudio, as it's come to my attention that some of you all want to learn about RStudio but don't have any background. Now, this video isn't all-encompassing and there's so much more to learn, but I'm hoping by watching this video it will at least help you in learning about R. So what I'm going to assume first is that you've installed R. If you haven't installed R, uh, I would recommend going to this PDF on our Canvas page and it's going to go through on how to install R in R Studio. Now, I didn't create this document. Um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Matt Slifko, who's a professor at High Point University, did it, but I thought he did an amazing job. What this video is going to do is, using this R tutorial basic script, which I will give you, we're going to go through and learn about several different things. Um, most, more specifically, we're going to learn how to change the RStudio display. We're going to learn about what these different windows are, defining variables, functions, how to install packages, to use functions, um, reading in data sets, talking about data frames, because we'll be using those a lot in this class, and some basic plotting. Um, so let's get started in talking about the first one on how to change the RStudio's display. So right now you can see that I have a blue screen. Most likely if this is your first time opening up our studio, you would have like a very bright white screen. And so how you change your preferences in the display, you go to preference, appearance, and then you can sit here and you can play with all of these different kinds. Um, why I choose a darker screen is because I tend to look at the computer a lot and this bright white page would give me a headache after 15 minutes of looking at it. And so all you have to do is hit apply and then OK. And so this is probably what yours first looked like. So let's go there again. Let's go back through this. R Studio, Preference, Appearance, and then I think I'm going to use Cobalt for today's lecture. OK. And so that's just something simple. Also, you noticed that you can change the font, the zoom, and everything. And I've played with this a lot of times. Okay. Next, we're going to learn about the different windows in R. So right now, this top uh, left corner is called the source window. And so this is dedicated to where you kind of write scripts and all that. So up here, you can see different tabs. This one should look familiar from lesson one. This is going to be your lesson two script. And so this is where you can type and save code. The bottom left is your console. So I could do simple stuff like this. Um, and this is also where you're going to get your output. We'll be seeing that through this uh, video. The top right corner, so right up here, is your environment. So if I was to declare a variable, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, you would see the variables come up. Also functions and other stuff. Now we can go to history and it will show us all the code we've written, have written. This probably comes more in handy as you get more and more complex code and you want to go back and look at stuff. Um, then in our bottom right corner is the probably most useful part of our studio. And so it has your files. Um, this is where our current directory is. Uh, maybe we'll look at that. When we make plots, they'll come up here. Packages, we'll also talk about that later on. And then help. So earlier I needed help remembering about what one of these functions did. And so I can use that help file. So that's just kind of the basic layout of R. Um, now let's start to learn how to define and view objects in R. So we can assign values to objects using two using using two ways this arrow type of format or an equal sign you can choose either one they're going to do the same thing so we can control copy or control paste or from right up here we can go control enter in max it's the command enter i think in windows it's control we can view right now you can notice that we didn't really see what A is, we can view our value by just typing the letter or doing print. 
pretty much what R is, it's a really super fancy computer. So we can run these different lines and get the results. The caret sign is um, the, putting something to an exponent. And then we have a function here for square rooting. Okay. Now, in R and in most uh, data sets, not everything's numerical. Sometimes we have um, characters. And so we can either do double quotes or single quotes. Here's the thing to notice is that when I print name and sport, they work identically and have double strings, double string. So this is again just quickly defining stuff saying, hey, R is a fancy computer. We can use characters and numbers. Um, you can use an equal sign or you can use an arrow sign to assign something. In my code, I'll show you, I tend to alternate. It just depends on the day. So I apologize for that. The next thing I want to talk about is functions in R and how to install R packages. So we've kind of already talked about the print, which is a function. Um, we'll see plot a lot. We've also already used square root. Um, another common stat one is doing the mean of, let's say, some numbers. So mean is a function. But sometimes what we're going to notice, especially in lesson two, this is why I bring it up, um, there are functions that require us to install packages. Why? Because R is an open sourced program, there are a lot of packages that others have created and allow us to use. And so in our lesson two, you'll see that we're going to need this multi comp for multiple comparisons. And so let's just install that to help us in our future. Now, there are two ways in which we can install new packages. The first way is by going up to this toolbar, pressing tools, package, then we type it in. Um, multi. Cool thing about doing it this way is it helps you spell it right. And then install. And it will do its installation. There we go. Perfect. Another way um, could be using this control, paste, and hit enter. I'm not going to do it because it's just going to do the same thing. Personally, I prefer doing it way one just so that I spell this right. Because if I spell this wrong, such as this way, it should give me an error. Boom. So this package isn't available. Really, I don't think that package exists. So I prefer doing it way one. It's your choice. So here's the thing though. You can, you should only have to install packages. So using this line or this way once, unless you end up completely re-updating, installing R, you should only have to do run this once. However, when you're running your code or you want to use a function in this library, you do have to run this. And so right now we're in a new session, control copy, paste. And this would allow us to use this library. We will use this library in our lesson two script. Um, if we quit out of R or R studio, I use them interchangeably, we'll have to reactivate the library, i.e run this line of code, but we won't have to install it again. The only time you'd have to reinstall it is if you completely removed R from your um, laptop or computer. Okay. And again, this is just an introduction. We'll see a lot more use of using libraries throughout our class, but just trying to get you guys into the mindset of what's happening. So the next thing I want to talk about is reading a data set into an object or a variable. So if we have a very short um, vector or matrix, we can, oh, that's not supposed to be there. We can easily kind of create a vector doing variable name, assignments, 
And then using this concatenation function, C, numbers, and commas. And so let's just look at what this is. So we're going to run it. Then we're going to print. And we can see it's a vector. Okay. Um, notice I could do this. And it's going to get me the same thing. So this just looks better and I can see everything in my small screen. We talked about printing. You can also, again, find the mean. So you can put this into functions and the mean of this is 57. That really means nothing. But right now it means nothing. Another way, let's say we have a lot of data or we can, or we have a CSV file, which I'll typically give you in this class, we can read in it this way. So I'm going to run this line and it's going to give me an error. And this error, I want to bring it up, was there's no such file uh, pane example in our directory. So first thing we want to do, let me just put this here and keep it, is you want to always look at what directory in. So you can do that by doing git directory. So I am currently user, so I'm in this directory, but there's no file. So you have to make sure, let me just move this over, you have to make sure that the file you're trying to get is in the same directory. Now a question you might ask is, well what if this git working directory wasn't here? So my R tutorial is in this folder, but what if maybe I was originally in this folder? How can I set my working directory such that we're in the same folder? Let me show you. So to set your working directory, you go to session, set working directory, and you're going to choose your directory. I'm already here. I can go open. If I wasn't, I could go find the proper one and then click open. So this gets your directory. You could also set your directory this way. So it's important for two things that you're in the direct that you're in the right directory and that your file is also in that directory. Okay? So now that we have our file in the correct directory and we are in all that, we can now run this code. A good thing you always want to do is always look at your data after reading it in to make sure nothing kind of wonky happened. And so we can do that by doing view data. And so we see we have our paint and we have our rec reflectivity. One thing to notice is this header equals true. And so that's pretty much saying in our CSV file, we had a header. If I did false, and I ran and viewed this control copy paste. Notice that by saying header equals false, now the first row has paint and uh, reflectivity. So always want to make sure that you know what you're reading in. Does it have a header or not? You could also, I don't know where I was going with that sentence, but boom. So always view your data just to make sure nothing weird's happening. Always a good rule of thumb. Something else we can do, let me run this so we have the right. Perfect. Something else you can do is you can view the top of your data. So that's showing us the top six. We can also view the tail of the data. So that's the bottom five or six. We can use name data, which is gonna give us the column names right up here. Another way is you do column data. Um, you can get the number of rows and columns. So we have 16 rows, two columns, all that makes sense. Again, this is just a great way to make sure that your data was read in properly. Now, let's say we, if we come up here, we don't like these names. We don't like paint and reflectivity. We can change the column names by saying column name data assigning it, and then putting in uh, what we want to change it. So let's just run this real quick. Boom, and now our column names have changed. We can also, 
in this data, which is a data frame, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, um, call only this column by saying data dollar sign P. And so now we see all that. Now it is common to use this and then if this was numeric, apply some type of mean and all that. But we could also assign it to a new variable as this. So if we look at data R and then we look at reflect, they're the same thing. Okay. Now I just mentioned a new word called data frame. And so let's talk just a little bit more about that in this example where we have students, Jane, Sally, and Cassidy. We have age and we have their grade. So I'm going to control copy run this. Um, a data frame is a special type of data set that we use to store data table. Um, pretty much we can store categorical and num uh, numerical data in it. Right now, the student age and grade are all kind of independent, I would say. And so what we want to do is to be able to combine it so that Jane 23 and Junior all line up in a data frame. How we do that is by saying variable student data and assign it data frame with the three variables. So let's control paste and let's print that out. And we can see Jane is 23 and she's a junior. If we want more information on this data frame, we can do str. And what it's going to tell us is we have three observations, three variables, and it's going to tell us how we can get our variable name. It's also student is also listed as a factor with three levels, Cassidy, Jane. Um, age is a numeric, grade is also a factor. So it tells us stuff. Now, another important thing that is typically used by our users is, or really any programming user is indexing. And so what if we only wanted the second student? So we only wanted to know who the second student was for some reason. We can do that by data or student data, dollar sign student, and using brackets, we can indicate what we want. So let's run this and see what it gets us. See, we get Sally, so it matches. Perfect. Another way we can do this is if we go back to our ref reflectivity, our data dollar sign R, and we want that fifth element, it's gonna give us the fifth element. Do we believe that that's the fifth element? I'll just verify you. One, two, three, four, five. Fifth element is 21. Perfect. Now, we know that this has 16 elements. Another way we can verify that is using length of data r. And so it's going to tell us we have 16. So if I assign something or I'm trying to index something outside of it, it's going to give us an NA for not an answer, okay? And so that's a good indicator. Now, we don't only just work with vectors, but we also work with matrices. And how we can define a matrice is through here. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna take the elements one through 12, and it's gonna create a three row by four column matrix. And I'll just explain what this by row true means. run it and now let's print it. And so what the by row true means is it's going to input the data by row first and then by the next row. If this wasn't true, so if I would take this false, run it, what it's going to do is it's going to input by column first. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now let's go back to the my matrix and how do we get certain elements? Again, it's just through the bracketed, bracketing, um, where the first number is going to represent the row, 
and the second column, the second number is going to represent the columns. So my matrix, 2, 3, 2, 3 should get a 7, and it does. We can also get the entire row. So if we just wanted the third row, we can also get the entire column. So we want the fourth column. Oop, that's hard, but 4, 8, 12. Sometimes maybe you want a submatrix. So we can use this colon 3 and 3, 4. So what this is getting us is row 2 and 3 with columns 3 and 4. So it's giving us 7, 8, 11, and 12. Boom. You can also just type in the 2 colon 3 and it'll do that. 2 colon 4, 2, 3, 4. So, so far, we've really just kind of talked about how we define variables, how we input it, how we can use functions. There's a lot of functions. How we install packages so that we can use new functions. What we just talked about was indexing. Lastly, I'm just going to teach you guys some basic plotting. Okay. So, one basic plotting is we're going to say we have an X. We're going to have 100 x's. What this x is going to look like is it's going to go from 0 to 2 pi and have a length of 100. This is just going to create a sequence from 0 to 2 pi with 100 numbers. There's a lot of different ways you can, or not a lot, but another way you can use sequence and how you can look at that is through using this help. By doing question mark sequence, you can look at the different variables. So here we use the length, so we just want 100 numbers, but we could also do by. So maybe you want to go from 0 to 2 pi in increments of 0.2. So that's another way. Then we want a y, so we can make a good graph. We have an x and a y. And our y is just going to be the sign applying the sine function to all of our x's. So let's look at our x's. We have 100 numbers. Our y is just executing x, the sine of each of those x's, and storing it into y. If we were to plot this, it's going to show up in this window. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Oop. Plots. And so right now, by doing this line type L, we're going to get a line. We could also do um, points, which is circle. Also, this is the default, so if I didn't even put this in here and ran it, it gets you the same thing. Sometimes you maybe want a line and points, so you can do both. Here it's a little bit harder because we have a lot of points, so let me just make this smaller. Wait, that's not working how I was expecting. So again, let me just go to help, make sure it's doing what I'm thinking. Yeah, it should be. Maybe it's just still too many points. Boom. Okay. So it's just all the points were super close, but now we can have a dot and a line if you prefer that. Um, let's say uh, we want to add another point on here. We can use the function points and what this is going to do is it's going to put a point at 2 x is 2 y is 0 it's going to color it red and it's going to change the symbol so now we have a triangle there are a lot of different symbols you can use the best way to know which ones you want to are google pchr so we go here So we go here, just PCHR, and typically I just look at this. But these numbers will represent which ones you get. So 2 gives the triangle, the default is 1. Okay? Another thing that might be helpful if you want to make your lines bigger, line width equals, just make it dramatic, makes that bigger as an help. We can also add more. 
points. Let me take this back to 100 so it gets us a good example. Boom. So here, what this is doing is it's saying, here's a w. We define it as 2 times pi times x minus 1. So if we looked at the length of w, we have 100. But we only see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What's happening is, is if you just put one vector or one value, it is going to assume that your x value is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, continuing. And so we are actually aren't seeing the rest of these points. How you would be able to adjust this screen so that you could see the rest of the points is by going way back up here in your original plot function and changing it so that your x lm, your x limit, equals c from 0 to 100, and our y limb should probably be like 0 to 40. So we're going to run that. We see our little squiggle. Every, we got wider x's and y's, points, and now let's rerun this, and you can see it now. And so that is one problem with R is you kind of got to know your bounds and put it in your plot originally. Now, if we wanted to, this points is adding points. So line is going to add lines, just so we can understand exactly what we're going to see. Let's get rid of this. We have our points, and now what we're going to draw is a line through them, so we can have lines. Boom. If you wanted lines and points, you could just do line type equal both. We'll make this a different color so we see what's changing. Boom. And so it's going to do that point line as well. There are some other graphics that are pretty important for statisticians, um, which are histogram and box plot. So if I was to generate 100 random points from a normal with standard deviation 1 and mean 0, and we run the histogram, we can just run a histogram like this. Now there are other defaults and inputs you could put, so histogram, check it. You can look into this and breaks and all that. Another important one is box plot. So if we wanted to do a box plot of our variable, boom. But oftentimes we're not just looking at one box plot, we are looking at several and comparing the variances between two groups. And so if, let's say we create another variable. We're going to C bind these two. What that's going to do is right now we have random normal, which is 100 points, and we have different normal, which is 100 points. By column binding these, we're going to get a matrix of 100, and scroll up, random, different normal. Okay, then we just put it into our box plot function, and we get two box plots. And that's going to be the end of our tutorial. So again, this isn't a very comprehensive tutorial. You're not, you don't know all of R now. Shoot, I barely know all of R and I've been using it for six or seven years now. This is just to help introduce you to R and get your feet wet to get you through some of our lessons as I introduce new stuff. Hopefully this helps and see you guys later.